Let's return to This Week in America. Here's your host, Rick Bratton. Welcome back, everybody. Coast to coast, This Week in America. Three oceans, 61 ports, 31,000 nautical miles, and 300 days of adventure aboard a ship equals endless lessons on exploration, people, and culture. In February 1979, our guest Robert Easton sailed to sea via the Yankee Trader along with 75 others and a crew of 20-plus people. His book is called Sailing Around the World in 300 Days, The Last World Cruise at the Yankee Trader. It's not only a book about circumnavigation, it's also Robert's record about the beauty of nature, appreciation of various people around the globe, and the beautiful lessons that a life of adventure offers. Robert is a native of the state of Washington, earned two liberal arts degrees from Central Washington State College, has done postgraduate work at colleges in California. Even though classified a veteran of the Korean War, he served only in Europe and stateside in Army Post as a teletype operator, message center clerk for the U.S. Army Signal Corps during 1953 and 54. His article about Jack London placed 22nd out of 100 in the 1974 Writer's Digest article contest. He's numerous uh, published numerous nonfiction articles, published several books. He lives in Sacramento, four grown children, six grand and children and Robert Easton, our guest, the author of Sailing Around the World in 300 Days, The Last World Cruise and the Yankee of the Yankee Trader. Robert, welcome to the program, sir. It's great to have you with us. Thank you very much, Rick. Thank you. Glad to be here. What a great story. What a great adventure. Let's sort of talk about you for a second and where maybe this uh, this all began to do something quite this adventuresome. Let's talk about the childhood. What was that like for you? Yes, well, I grew up in this tiny town of 600 people uh, along the end of the Empire Highway uh, 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 south of Spokane, Washington. So I'm a native of the state of Washington. Okay. And uh, uh, this town was made, made famous because there was an Indian battle there, and that, that started me off. I, re- I wrote about this battle where American soldiers were killed and so were the, some Indians, and there's a monument on the hill, and uh, that that's where why people could, from all over came to see this. And other little wheat towns in that area kind of died out, but our town stayed at 600 population, uh, and it was a it was just a typical Western town, uh, just like you'd see in the in the Western movies. Uh, you know, uh, one. One of each kind of store, like one grocery, <laughs> one yes. uh, baker, uh, and so forth, on both sides of the street, and it just uh, and uh, so uh, every June we'd have this what they call the Battle Day celebration, uh, where people come from all over uh, because we were on a paved road for one thing. But at every it was, this was the first part of June every year, and people come and they'd have street dances and uh, big celebration just just because of this Indian battle and the monument on the hill. People come to see this monument, and uh, this is all wheat land. And I was just uh, we had uh, three railroads going through that town, but I was trapped in that in that environment. And I longed to get out. As a child, I had a sort of a huckleberry thin existence, oh, yes. a John Boy Walton type experience. <laughs> yes, uh, that, that's the way I saw myself. And uh, I was always in a corner reading some some book. And uh, I had a, uh, a older sister by a year and a younger brother by a year. So there were three of us children, and we lived in three different houses in town. And uh, 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 so, uh, it, it was a typical small town existence. Uh, and, uh, uh, let's see, uh, got it. yeah, it sounds like it was a, a nice childhood, but you're looking around and you sort of like to get out of there. How did that go from, <laughs> I, I have these dreams to travel to deciding and making that decision to sail around the world? Why did you decide to do that? That's a big jump. Yeah, it was a big jump because <laughs> I, you know, we did have a library in town, and as I got into high hospital or got into high school, 
uh, and my sister moved away to Washington State College in Pullman, and my brother went to live with friends out in the country, and uh, that our, our parents divorced, and that, that made, as I was 18, and that made a whole difference in, in, uh, in my life. But uh, uh, I, I spent a lot of time by myself reading, and that was my that was my big hobby, actually. Although roaming around, we had a river, a little a creek going through, and uh, you know, boys like to explore that. It was a muddy creek, but oh, yes. South Pine, Pine Creek. We're thirty-two miles south of, Sp- of Spokane. Yeah. Uh, so you decide so you yeah go ahead finish the story because from yeah. there you decide to to sail around the world. I'm still in awe at, at that and your decision to go ahead and to do something this exciting. Well, as I got into high school, I I started reading ads in the Holiday magazine and uh, and uh, Sunset magazine, and I thought, well, that would be one way to get out of. of of my life and, and change my life. And, uh, uh, most of the other, uh, boys, my age, my high school, my high school class was, uh, 29, uh, uh, students. And so, uh, now half of them are gone. Uh, but, uh, I just decided I just had to take myself up by the bootstraps and since my parent, my, my, uh, parents marriage dissolved, I, I really didn't have any choice, but to actually, what I did is I went to college at uh, Eastern Washington College at Cheney, uh, which is a little bit uh, 23 miles east of Spokane, and that that changed my life really. That that set me toward uh, bigger and better things, and I I stayed. I uh, went to various colleges and uh, graduated, got a couple of degrees, and all of this was slowly, it just slowly developed into this idea that I wanted to see more of the world, and, and I didn't want to go back to where I came from, uh, you know. Uh, yes. So I just, it was, it was everything was going to be upward and onward for, as far as I was concerned from here on out. Well, it certainly was, and our guest on the program is Robert Easton. This is his story, Sailing Around the World in 300 Days, the last world cruise of the Yankee trader. Uh, we'll talk about that cruise specifically in, in a second, but I'm fascinated. You had, a, as a young child, you enjoyed reading, obviously enjoyed writing. Talk about the decision to write the first couple of books, I think the first three books. Why Why did you decide to, to get involved not only in reading books, but writing them as well? Well, I thought that my life was kind of different, uh, that I was I was growing up in a in a sort of a vacuum that we were we were set apart from the rest of the world. Uh, not too many strangers came in, and uh, it's strange that the, the population stayed at 600 people. We had this like a lot of things we didn't have. Like I don't think we had a a uh, uh, we didn't have a a, a, a a lot of things like you see in most towns. It was just a typical. Uh, one one main drag town yes. and the battle day celebration was a was a big highlight of the year but uh i'd like to move on now to to the, the trip itself well let's talk uh, about that because you described crossing the equator not once not twice not three times you did it four times and a big ceremonies that followed what was that like crossing the equator well, every year uh, or every time you, we crossed the equator, there were 75, uh, roughly 75 passengers. And uh, what they did is they you had the King Neptune ceremony and people that hadn't, uh, passengers that hadn't crossed the, cere- the, the equator before uh, were blindfolded. Uh, they had to wear their, their clothes inside out, including <laughs> their underwear. Uh, and they were taken in front of a lot of people like uh, one person was impersonating a dentist and so he he had to open his mouth and he squirted some stuff in there and you were blindfolded you didn't know what it was so this was all initiation this was the polywog initiation uh, conducted by the uh, uh, 
the, the passengers that had, that had crossed the equator before, they had one big, rather rotund gentleman uh, with his shirt off, uh, and they, he had his uh, middle part of him uh, uh, covered with uh, margarine, and so you had to kiss that. They called that kissing the baby. You had to kiss the baby, <laughs> and uh, all this while blindfolded, and... Uh, uh, the dentist was screw, uh, was messing around in your mouth, shooting things in your mouth, and various uh, uh, various uh, embarrassing things like that. While while the uh, the uh, uh, the people that had crossed the equator already, they were uh, gleefully watching this going <laughs> going on. So yes, they were enjoying uh, every minute of it. I, I'm sure. Yeah, and we did this four times because we crossed the equator four times. That's just to be this story and so many more in Robert Easton's book, Sailing Around the World in 300 Days, the last world cruise uh, of the Yankee uh, trader. Talk about your, you're on this cruise. What were some of the activities you and the passengers did, uh, enjoyed on the journey? Because you're gone for 300 days. What were some of the, uh, yeah. some of the activities? Well, one thing that went on, we had two really professional fishermen, and they were trolling from the back. And so we we caught some rather huge fish, and it took about four or five of us to bring these big fish aboard. Like a tuna, for instance, it's a big, heavy fish. And so we'd all run down, and somebody would say, fish on. We all ran down into the uh, lower part of the uh, the ship, toward the end of the, the ship, and uh, and uh, and pull these chips, uh, these fish in, and of course we all ate, all enjoyed eating them. That was one of the activities we had. Uh, and uh, the, the course there was scuba diving, there was hiking, uh, a lot of stuff on on islands and various cities that we stopped in. Uh, various classes went on the ship. Uh, they were like everything. Uh, one girl uh, captured some uh, hermit crabs, and so she'd have crumb uh, 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 races with these crabs, uh, <laughs> hermit crabs. And every afternoon we'd have the rum swizzle time, and that was a concoction mixed up by our bartenders, uh, which were rather delicious. I, uh, 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 I think probably some sort of lemonade mixed with rum this is all rum country with a lot of we went into a lot of rum country oh, island imagine. yes yes so uh that, that was uh just part of what well, we had the ship had movies it had uh, uh a lot of a lot of things actually we had uh, uh a lot of things going on exercise classes scuba classes uh fishing uh, uh, nautic navigation classes, uh, some for everybody. Yeah, and there are people that just love to sit around and play cards. Well, I, I'm sure of that. And doing it in different locations, basically, uh, what almost on a daily basis. You mentioned some of the islands. The places you stopped weren't necessarily places the big cruise ships were were stopping at at the time. What were some of the places that you recall that were the most remote that that you stopped at? Yeah, I meant to say we. When we saw those big cruise ships come in, with uh, they'd lead these passengers around with megaphones, and they were like, you know, they'd they'd engor they'd uh, uh, let all these passengers come out. They'd have to uh, surround them with megaphones and guides and everything, and so they'd, they'd guide them to the shops, the gift shops, and so forth. And so when we, when the Yankee trader would see those big ships come in. That's usually when we decided to leave, and so uh, the most the most remote places that we went to, we always everybody wanted to be far away, you know, from a lot of other big cruise ships. So, and we were a small cruise ship. Uh, the 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 most remote was probably Easter Island, Pitcair Island, uh, Saint Helena Island in the Atlantic Ocean. And along with Pitcairn was uh, Henderson Island because Henderson Island was pretty close to Pitcairn, and we'd take there was fifty nine pass uh, fifty nine people living on uh, Pitcairn at that time, and uh, we took their uh, 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 their uh, longboats and uh, 
went to Henderson Island and helped them uh, capture their carving wood. And we loaded aboard the Yankee trader and helped them bring it back to Pitcairn so they could, the wood carvers could make souvenirs for the tourists. But <laughs> at that time, uh, uh, that was still pretty remote, and it still is. Just, and uh, uh, we had uh, a very enjoyable time with, with the people of Pitcairn Island. Just so many experiences. You can imagine spending 300 days traveling around the world. The book is Sailing Around the World in 300 Days, The Last World Cruise of the Yankee Trader. Robert Easton is our guest on the program. Book available at uh, at Amazon, all the usual places. Go to our website, This Week in America. Dot us and they kind of get all of that information. That's a long time to be gone. 300 days. Did people take animals with them? Yeah, I meant to say we had uh, we had a young stewardess, very charming young girl, that, and uh, she had cats, uh, two cats, kittens. One was Rasta and one was Kaya. And uh, then, uh, so she just take, took care of those kittens in her cabin. And uh, she was a stewardess. She works as a stewardess. And uh, uh, we also had a, bir- a bird uh, came out of nowhere and hit one of our masts. And so we had a couple of uh, ship's doctors, and we, they took care of this bird. And uh, we called him Freddy the Freeloader. <laughs> and by the time we'd reached Easter Island, he must have smelled the, sea, the land breezes because he just picked up and flew him flew back and flew flew to uh easter island you know it's uh, interesting we, yeah the the mishap injuries from a bird how about people any uh, that again that's a long time oh, to be out there you're out in some primitive areas were there injuries along the way yeah there were i remember one one uh really uh, uh tall guy the guy was over six feet he, he fell down the stairs and uh, we had two ship's doctors and uh, so they, they took care of him. I don't think he broke any bones, but that was one of the, the serious injuries. Uh, the other injuries were uh, uh, coral cuts from uh, swimming. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, and also we were uh, robbed quite a bit at knife, knife point, uh, in, uh, per- particularly I remember Panama. Uh, so there were various assaults in various ports. And, uh, but nothing, you know, we all survived it, got back okay. Uh, a lot of, I stayed with every, uh, every time the, the, uh, Yankee trader moved, I moved with her. I went, that's why I could say I went completely around the world. A lot of people took a break by the, they had, they could afford to go to one guy went to Russia. Uh, some went home and stayed home for, a couple of weeks or maybe longer and then came back and joined the, uh, the, the trader further on. So it was just, uh, the, the, the route was already, the captain knew where he was going and we were always able to, to be where we we're supposed to be at the, at the right time. And, uh, and you were there the uh, entire time, sailing around the world yes. in 300 days. The uh, autobiography, <laughs> The Last World Cruise, The Yankee Trader by Robert Easton, our guest on the program. A few minutes left. I'm fascinated. You talk about some of the remote places you visited. What were some of the bigger cities that you visited? Uh, the biggest uh, was Singapore, but uh, no doubt about it. Probably maybe the second was Quito, uh, uh, Cape Town, and then Quito, uh, in uh, Peru, uh, Cape Town, South Africa, Durban, uh, South Africa, uh, Mombasa, uh, and uh, uh, there were several ab- about that uh, population probably, but by far the biggest where we spent two weeks was Singapore, and uh, uh, and then probably the second was Cape Town, South Africa, and. Uh, uh, a lot of these people did a lot of adventurous things like uh, sailing uh, on, uh, in Africa uh, above the, the, uh, the uh, game lands, watching the buffalo herds moving, and had quite an adventure. Uh, so I wasn't the only one having adventures, but, <laughs> but my mission was to stay with the ship. So uh, uh, what was interesting, too, is we had a, 
uh, passengers that looked an awful lot like like uh, uh, the movie star Michael Douglas. And uh, when he was popular making movies, oh, and yes. he looked just so much like him. So we had to make a joke of that, and I, that's included in the book. Uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll never forget him. <laughs> he was really a character. One of the many, many stories that's such a delightful read, sailing around the world in 300 days, the last world cruise of the Yankee trader, Robert Easton, the author, and with us on the program. Uh, it, maybe one more question I want to sneak in here. Were there, how long were you out at sea and didn't see land? Were there times when you're out there, just keep looking around and you you don't see any land? Uh, our longest time was probably nine days. There were no, no sounds. There were no airplanes. Uh, very few birds, uh, didn't see too many ships. Uh, I, I don't, we didn't see any ships, matter of fact, and, uh, our, our airplanes. And, uh, it, it's, it's a lonely feeling. It's really, you think you look at all that water and yes. you say to yourself, boy, it would really be easy to drown. And I remember standing on the top deck uh, and the captain that was, uh, telling a, a few of us, he said, if anybody ever falls overboard, just take everything you can find and, and throw in anything that they might hang on to. He says, because it takes the Yankee trader quite a while to turn around to, to rescue them. And uh, way out there, you know, the tide can be pretty rough. And uh, so, but fortunately, uh, that never happened. We didn't lose anybody. And we had a couple of doctors who were very, very proficient. And, uh, uh, it was, it was, a, it was a joy to have them and, a, and a comfort. Well, it's a joy to read the book and get a, an inside glimpse of something we've all thought about at least for a while, maybe not 300 days, but for a while would be fun to do. Helping you and get the word out on this has been Reader's Magnet working with you. What has that been like working with them to, to get your book sailing around the world in 300 days into the public hands? Boy, they worked hard. They did a lot. Uh, I'm so proud of them. And I, I, I got some of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, of the work they've done, the, the posters and so forth. I just received them. And uh, uh, frankly, you know, uh, boy, if I had a chance, I'd, I'd make that trip again. I think anybody would because that's, in the modern world, that's true adventure, I think. Uh, as close as you can get to it, you know. Yes. Uh, I've been a member of the Sierra Club for years, and we traveled all over the mountains of the West, and I had a lot of different experiences. And, but there, there was just there's just nothing to compare to a trip around the world. And uh, we had uh, good sh good shipmates as well as good crew members. And uh, the the uh, the sad thing of it is a lot of those people uh left us and and uh, the windjammer fleet is no more and uh uh, uh that's that was a tragedy and we're all sorry about that but that's a story that somebody else is going to have to write well you've done an excellent job with this and i was going to ask you with 300 days it, when you got off what is it like i don't this has been great but i want to do it again you actually would go back if you had the chance yes i would yes well, that yeah. says something about the enjoyment. And you can, you're can you there with Robert for 300 days. Most of us can't do that, but we can experience that by, by going with Robert in his book, Sailing Around the World in 300 Days, The Last World Cruise of the Yankee Trader. Robert Easton is the author and our guest. That's E-A-S-T-O-N. Book available wherever books are sold. Of course, available at Amazon. If you go to our website, thisweekinamerica.us, you can log on directly to get information on the book. Robert, it's been a pleasure having you with us on the program, talking about that uh, world cruise in 300 days. Thank you, sir, for being with us on the program. Thank you very much, Vic and Rick. It's been so nice talking to you. I, I just, of course, I'll always love talking to anybody about that trip. Probably the highlight of my life. And uh, uh, I've written uh, not just stuff that was uh, in in the book, but uh a lot of other notes, and it seems like I'm still writing something <laughs> about it. 
to well, do is, uh, yep. because, you know, it's pretty hard to overcome something like that. You know, like, how do, how do you top this, you know? Yes. Go to the moon? Maybe I, that's well, the only way to top it, you know? That could be it. In the meantime, just keep writing about it, and you can relive it, and we can relive it with you. The book, again, is Sailing Around the World in 300 Days, The Last World Cruise of the Yankee Trader by Robert Easton. Information on our website, This Week in America. US and we're back after these messages. This Week in America is online. You can visit our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Scott Pinkerton, associate producer of This Week in America. Jay Anderson, segment producer. Ben Watson, webmaster. Otto Bache, director of engineering and TV production. This Week in America produced and is a trademark of Blue Funk Broadcasting, LLC. For information on all of our guests and to listen to this week's show, our website again at thisweekinamerica.us. And I'm Sean Bratton, executive producer of This Week in America.